Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, and Dr. Malati, it could be pecan or pecan, whatever you want to say. Okay, I should have brought some pecan nuts with me or pecans with me just to hand out. All right, so I am a neuropsychologist and I specialize in brain behavior. All right, my job is to um, help individuals understand their cognitive strengths and weaknesses. And what I've done over the last 20 years is to try to understand brain function. And just like Dr. Malati said, why some individuals experience memory or thinking issues after surgery with anesthesia. Now, uh, typically we may think of surgeries with regard to deep brain stimulation surgeries. You might be thinking that because that might be at the foremost of your mind. But honestly, I'm talking about any surgical procedure with anesthesia. This could be colonoscopies, this could be having a knee surgery, it could be having an eye surgery, a cataract surgery, et cetera. Uh, and the work that I'm going to show you is based on years of work that we've done at the University of Florida, but also nationally and internationally, okay? Um, so let me move forward as to why we've developed at UF this program that's called Perioperative Cognitive Anesthesia Network. And again, this is a culmination of years of work that has been done all over the world. All right, so the basic outline here for the talk. I'm going to talk about first Parkinson's surgery and hospitalization, some things to consider. I'm going to talk about how we're trying to change healthcare for you and for us and for the future generation and the vision looking forward. So as you know, you've probably heard stories. You've probably heard stories about an individual or a family member who has elected to have a hip surgery. And after the hip surgery, they experienced some subtle confusion or changes in their memory and attention. All right, or you may look back and say, wow, my mom was doing so well before she had that hip surgery. What happened during that surgery? Um, and that's the kind of, uh, those are the kind of stories that many of us here who are in uh, medical professions experience that we hear that, but particularly surgeons have heard that. Uh, those stories, and they've been trying to understand why those changes have occurred. Um, now, what's interesting is that what we have learned is that uh, of individuals who experience changes after surgery, most of the time it is uh, temporary. Changes, can la they can occur, they can experience delirium, which is the confusion, or they can experience just cog not feeling as sharp all right, after surgery. And typically that, that change will improve over time. Um, but there are certain individuals who seem particularly vulnerable to experiencing delirium or confusion after surgery. And that's what we are trying to uh, herald here at the University of Florida, but particularly within this program. So historically, and you've probably heard this, that surgeons, they, all, they will ask an anesthesia anesthesiologists, and you probably have done this yourself, you've, you've had to get a cardiac clearance prior to having a surgical procedure, right? And this is a common thing that anesthesiologists and surgeons will ask for. They'll ask for a, 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 um, a cardiac clearance for individuals who might have atrial fibrillation, they might have um, um, any type of uh, abnormality, heart failure. Before they go in for their hip or knee surgery, they'll get a cardiac clearance. But one thing that is notorious is that brain clearance or neuro clearance is not acquired. So for individuals who have Parkinson's disease, they may not even, um, individuals who are anesthesiologists or in the medical professions who are, hand, who are working with you for your surgery, they may appreciate you have Parkinson's disease, but they won't do any, they often are um, not knowledgeable a lot about Parkinson's disease. And additionally, they um, don't, consider a lot of aspects with regard to who particularly might be vulnerable to delirium. 
So this is an issue for us. We really argue that neuroconsults should be standard of care because surgery is a brain stress test. It's a whole body stress. Whenever anybody goes in for a surgical procedure, um, it's important to realize that the brain is an organ, right, that's in charge of our behavior, and it is the organ that is getting a direct um, impact of the anesthetic, but also just the overall experience of having to go into the hospital in the morning to dehydrate. You have to be uh, fasting before your surgery. There's a whole host of things that happen metabolically throughout the surgery, but also from an anxiety and even a depression level, all right? So what we argue is that the brain is extremely important to consider, and not to just consider all the organs from the neck down, but let's consider the, the brain itself and the brain's function. Now, one thing to consider about the brain's function is the brain is who we are. It is our memory. It is, it's the, it is the organ that helps us with our thinking, with our emotions, okay? So in order to assess the brain, the, what we argue is let's have the brain do what it does best. Let's sit with a person and understand their strengths and weaknesses and review that person's unique profile and then send that information to the anesthesiologist and the surgeon to help them improve and optimize their surgical care for that individual. So that's our overall goal. It's very similar to a cardiac stress test, but we argue it for the brain. All right. And so this is based on research that we've done over and over. There's tons, uh, there's a wealth, baskets fulls of papers that say that individuals who are going to experience cognitive issues after surgery, such as a hip, a shoulder, abdominal surgery, hysterectomy, individuals who experience changes after surgery procedures, those are individuals who are older, Usually the research has been done, international studies, they show that people who continue to have cognitive issues after surgery are people age 60 and older, all right? And the older you are, the more likely you will to have issues after surgery from a cognitive perspective. Individuals who are frail, all right? Reduced motor strength, reduced balance, reduced muscle, okay? Individuals who have cognitive weaknesses, but particularly people who have reduced um, functions specifically in attention and memory. Those are the two main regions. As well as individuals who have fewer years of education, and that's actually associated with the concept of cognitive reserve. All right. And the more neuronal networks you have, or just limited um, ref, uh, resources perhaps around you. Um, there's a whole host of things that we can go into, and I'll be happy to answer any questions afterwards, of course. But those are the biggest predictors for post-operative complications. All right, now, here's a really interesting fact, all right, that we know that in the community of, of our community in Gainesville, at least 18 to 25 percent of individuals in the community have some form of at least mild cognitive impairment, all right? An early marker of Alzheimer's, they may have signs of cognitive issues associated with Parkinson's disease, okay, but there is at least 20% of our older adults in the community are having undiagnosed uh, markers or at least profiles of cognitive issues, all right? We've shown in our hospital at UF, we've shown the same thing for people who are coming in for surgeries, all right? About 25 to 33, one in five older adults who come into the hospital at UF um, have signs of at least mild cognitive impairment that has not been diagnosed. That's actually really amazing, okay? Um, and so that means that there are at least one in five individuals who have vulnerabilities for developing delirium and confusion after surgery. And delirium and confusion after surgery is an increased risk factor for mortality and an increased risk factor for delirium, I mean, uh, for dementia acceleration pathologies can change. So that's, that's really important, right? We need to have some sort of flag, right, for an individual who might have that risk factor for developing changes after surgery. Now, you may say, well, those people probably are diagnosed, right? They're in their medical chart that they have a cognitive issues. Surely their primary care physician has been able to identify individuals who, who have cognitive issues. But we know that's not true. 
So we did a review of all the UF health data that came through from 2018 and 2019, and cognitive issues or any sign of um, early markers or consideration for a cognitive concern is very, very um, uh, not often indicated within the medical charts. Only 4% of individuals coming through the hospital, and this, was a, this is about 25,000 individuals, had any indication of having a cognitive issue in their medical chart. And I can tell you also for Parkinson's disease, we see individuals who haven't been diagnosed yet and haven't discussed this, right, with their caregivers. So that's, a, um, or with their medical providers. So those might be individuals also who are within this diagnosis. And this is actually, that's any neurocognitive diagnosis at all was within the 4%. So why should we care about this, all right? Really, why should we care about this? Because individuals are increasing. Uh, our older sample, our older, our older um, uh, com community, um, be included, right? We're we're all we're just increasing exponentially across the country. All right, it's just part of what's happened within our U.S. Census. So we have increasing um, numbers of who are older, and increasing numbers who are older also with Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease is also increasing. So Florida has the highest rate of expected Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Um, it's expected that between 2020 and 2025, we're going to have a 24% increase in Alzheimer's disease, all right? So that's in Florida, in Florida. And then think about the fact that individuals are also coming in for surgeries and 50% of individuals coming in for surgeries are age 60 and up. That means 50% of the surgeries that are being done at hospitals are done on people age 60 and up. Okay, so we need to pay attention to this. Parkinson's disease is also increasing, unfortunately, um, despite our best efforts to have a treatment option. All right, and for this reason, there's been. A, I just want to sh give a shout out to the Na to the Parkinson's Foundation for putting information about how to be um, aware of how to how to manage hospitalization. Okay, so there's some wonderful booklets that are provided by the Parkinson's Foundation over there. You know, so um, and Parkinson's uh, the Parkinson's Foundation is also they want you to be aware of how to consider your diagnosis and your specialty characteristics when you go into a hospital. So they, they publish some wonderful information about how there's increasing needs expected for 1 million, 300,000 individuals will be going into the hospitals. So you need to be, uh, to be an advocate for yourself. All right. And this is also talking about complication rates. If you have Parkinson's disease, if you are gonna go into the hospital for a surgical procedure, and you have anesthetic, there's an increased risk of having um, a discharge with cognitive issues and delirium. There's also a higher risk of having motor symptoms accelerate. So this is, this is why I'm here, is to provide you with some information about this just so you're aware, but then also what can you do to help um, arm yourself with some defense. Okay. So right now we know that there are currently, uh, there's a lack of triggers within the medical system, in the healthcare system, indicating a person has Parkinson's disease and that brain wellness and physical wellness should be monitored, right? I told you that, that in general, anesthesiologists and surgeons um, and many of the care providers do not know and may not know how to deal with Parkinson's disease or what to do specifically for Parkinson's, but particularly for medications. There's a lack of proper surgical uh, intervention studies addressing the administration of Parkinson's disease medications, how to manage it after you come in for surgery, or if you just have to come in for some sort of, in if something happens and you're taken into the hospital, you have to be a proactive about your medications, all right? Few hospital staffs are really, they are not, um, they aren't trained on how to manage the medications relative to other medications, such as pain medications. And delirium, which is a confusion state where a person can have hyperactive, they can be agitated after a surgery, or they can be hypoactive, where they're just not alert as they were before the surgery. Those are very concerning cognitive signs and brain signs after a surgery. 
and delirium, that state, is not well monitored in our hospitals at this time. I can give you more information on that um, aside if anybody would like more facts on that. So that's an issue, right? Because we don't want our, change, our brains to change, right? We want to maintain our memory and our attention. We, don't, we want, when we go into the hospital to have a hip surgery, we want to come out the same way, except with a better hip, right? Okay, we want to have the same brain and the same abilities that we did when we elected this surgery to have an improvement of quality of life. Now, anesthesiologists are, are a great advocate and they are aware of this. They actually, one of my favorite anesthesiologists, Patrick Tai, you can see a quote from him up there. He says that patients ask him every single day, Am I gonna, is my memory gonna change after surgery? What are some things that you can do? Should you give me a spinal versus a, a general anesthetic, et cetera? What can you do? He says every single day patient, patients are asking. But he does, you know, but there's nothing to do, really. I mean, uh, there's some techniques that they can do for changing the anesthetic medications, um, but really it, it's up to the anesthesiologist to be knowledge about that person from the whole thing, from the top to the bottom, to understand that person's vital signs while they're monitoring them in the operating room. All right. Now here's another thing that's important for you to realize, and this is something that anesthesiologists also realize, that 30 to 40 percent of delirium episodes, meaning confusion after surgery, is preventable. Right? Here are the risk factors. Um, well, the risk factors for delirium, I thought it was on the next slide, but it's not. The risk factors for delirium, like I said, memory issues, frailty, okay, um, experiencing any issues with regard to um, dehydration, certain medications, all right? There's a whole host of different risk factors for delirium. If you can intervene on those before the event, but particularly before the surgical procedure, you have a greater likelihood of not having delirium after the surgery. So that's fantastic. And because of that, the American College of Surgeons put up guidelines in 2019, and they said, you know what? There needs to be some sort of appreciation for brain wellness before surgery. And what they've asked, I think this is a, you know, I want to shine for me as a laser, but it's not, okay. So they've said that they want people to get a brain check before surgeries with anesthesia, to at least something to like herald how a person was before their surgery. So basically what they're asking for is a brain snapshot is what I call it, okay? So do you know how you go in and you get your dental x-rays and you're going in or you go in and you get your eyes checked, right? What, what the American College of Surgeons is asking for is a brain check. They want some sort of snapshot about your cognition and your memory abilities before you have surgery so that the team members can know at least how you are and they can figure out, all right, does this individual have any particular risks for having a surgery with anesthesia that can predict delirium? Um, and they also want individuals to have a post-surgery brain check, all right? But a pre-operative brain check is fantastic. So a brain, a brain snapshot of some sort. So that's fantastic. Okay, I've done something wrong, all right. Chuck, do you have any idea what I can do here to help with the pointer? Or maybe I turned it off. This is my brain check right here. Okay, hold on one second. I'm sure that I can, oh, there it is. Okay, let me see. All right, so I gave you the rationale as to why we need to have appreciation for cognition, right? And consideration for brain wellness. Now, what can we do? Can we really change it? So because how many of you have had a brain check prior to your um, surgery with anesthesia? Have any of you had brain checks? No, okay, but we want them. We want brain checks, all right? Because we want to inform your anesthesiologists and your surgeons about your whole body, all right? So that's why we created this program called Perioperative Cognitive Anesthesia Network, all right? And we have, our mission is to improve uh, the knowledge for healthcare, promote awareness of brain health and wellness to the community, all right? All right, so this is what we've done in the hospital at UF, all right? So what we've done is we've started this pathway. We call it the PECAN pathway. 
Oh, and why do we call it pecan? Because it's easy to remember. Because everybody, okay, because everybody's a little nutty, right? Do you get it? Okay. And so it's, a, it's very easy to remember, PECAN, Perioperative Cognitive Anesthesia Network. So what we've done with this network is individuals who are age 65 and older who are coming in for surgery with anesthesia into the hospital, some, of, some individuals will be asked to come in and see a nurse in person or a nurse anesthesiologist in person. That, neuro, that nurse anesthesiologist will sit with the individual um, and review all different vital signs with them. And as part of their care, they will ask a person to do a cognitive screener, right? And some of the screener involves, you know, remembering some words, it might be drawing a clock, it might be saying the months forwards or backwards. It takes usually less than five minutes. That information is put in the medical chart and it saves as a snapshot. And that information is also sent to your anesthesiologist. If, you, if a person doesn't have any errors and they do well and they're not indicating any signs of any memory issues or they don't have Parkinson's disease, right, they're doing well, then they go on to their routine care. But if an individual is having issues with cognitive um, concerns, if they have a prior history of delirium, if they do not do well on that little screener, then they come to see me or any other provider that we have on our team as a neuropsychologist. And my job is to sit with the person one-on-one -on -one and understand their memory and thinking uh, strengths. It's a 30-minute evaluation, and then it has an interview, and then I give you feedback on what can you do, and I train you on how to look for delirium, and we talk about how can we optimize you from all different things, okay? We want to optimize your brain function. Then that person, I, I send a note to the anesthesiologist, I talk to the surgeons, um, we um, try to coordinate efforts, and then that person goes through surgery, uh, and then uh, that person is called by our team postoperatively to check on how they're doing. If a person's experiencing issues, then they go on, and they go, and if they're still having issues, then they go through what's called phase four, where they might see a behavioral neurologist, or they'll see somebody who can understand what's going on, and they'll help to figure out, okay, why are you having cognitive issues? And they put into a set of orders. So this is continued care pathway. We call it the new frontier for perioperative cognitive medicine. So there are different phases, like I said here. And so this is supported through UF. And we, these are some of the tests that we, we will do at times for the, pre, for the phase two, like I'll do for neuropsychology, so I can understand attention and memory. I can assess um, if a person's how their comprehension is. I can assess different things that will change the discharge instructions for a person. We also do it through Zoom. Uh, we do it through telemedicine. And we also do it on telephone because we're trying to stay as open to um, helping as many people as possible. This is a slide showing you the number of individuals that we've had come through the program here. The top of the, the, top of the flow chart shows you that um, the number of individuals who've come through the hospital, age 65 and up, and that was approximately 14,000 individuals over the period of two years. If you look down at the next box, you'll see how many uh, individuals the nurses actually did the screening, the phase one screening, with their months forwards or backwards or the clock drawing, all right? And that's approximately 12 to 13,000 individuals. So that's fantastic. Those people have a brain snapshot in their chart. A subset of those people, for whatever reason, end up coming down to phase two, and that's where I am, the neuropsychologist, all right? And what we were able to um, do is we were able to look at if an individual has cognitive complications or weaknesses or not, all right? And um, you'll see there that some individuals who come through, about 30% of them, it's the bottom box there, the bottom um, reddish box, 30% of individuals are doing cognitively fine, which tells us that um, our testing, the neuropsychologist, is more specific, right, than the general snapshot that's done. And we also tailor our recommendations to the team. Now, this is what we've seen on the people who've done the brain wellness check with uh, phase two. We see individuals who come through, like you said, 30% of people who are doing cognitively well. But then we also see people who have primary memory, primary memory problems, which is concerning for Alzheimer's disease. We see people who have primary attention problems. And we see individuals who have mixed uh, issues with memory and attention. And that suggests early signs 
or um, mild to moderate signs of having some sort of early uh, undiagnosed disease that we can help um, with perioperative care for, excuse me. All right. Um, and the general finding is that the nurse screening, like I said, is sensitive, right, which is fantastic. And the nurse screening does alone predict length of stay, hospital charge, so brain snapshots and brain care prior to surgery does predict outcome. Not only within our hospital, but other hospitals across the country have shown this. The neuropsychologist, the phase two, provides insight into the, insight into the type of impairment a person might have and provides an opportunity for multidisciplinary interventions, and that's what we really try to harness. And our job is to identify patients who have some vulnerabilities that warrant closer follow-up, because we care about brain wellness. So let me give you a case report to give you an example of what this, how this works. So this is a case report that was published by Kristen Hamlet, the first author. She was a neuropsychologist in our program. She's fantastic. Um, and she uh, published this in Anesthesia and Analgesia. And we have a lot of different case reports that we put out about teamwork and the need for multidisciplinary teamwork, but this is just one example. So this is an example of Mr. H. He's a 79-year-old, non-Hispanic, Caucasian man with lumbar, he had back pain. He had 12 years of education. He was a retired electrician, and he was living with his wife. He had three surgeries. Uh, the end of 2018, and then two more in 2019. So he, they were all completed by the same surgeon, and they were very similar types of surgeries to alleviate his back issue, all right? The one in December, he had had lumbar um, uh, surgery for L1 to 5. The one in March was from L3 to 4 on the left side, and then it was also lumbar 3 to 4 on the right side, all right? Now, he had had different types of experiences after each one. So for example, after the first surgery, he developed delirium, which was confusion, significant confusion after the surgical procedure. And he had to stay in the hospital for three days. And then he left um, and he, he went home, but he had home with health care, home care. Now, what was interesting is that he had actually failed a preoperative brain screener before having his surgery. He had actually gone in to see the nurse anesthesiologist and done the phase one check, but that he actually did not do that well on testing. And, but he didn't want to come through phase two, which honestly I don't blame him. He didn't want to see a neuropsychologist to do extra cognitive checks for 30 minutes. I mean, who really wants to do that, honestly? But honestly, I'll say that we make it fun, but he didn't want to do it, which I understand. Okay. so. All right, he experienced delirium. But then the surgeon said, let's have this, let's, we need to, you know, you're still having pain, how about we try it a new way? So he came through for the second surgery. Again, he failed the screener, completed by the nurse. Um, and he said, okay, I'll go and I'll do PCAN. I'll do the phase two of PCAN. And so he came and saw Kristen Hamlet. So she did a thorough review with him. And then she routed her note and it went to the anesthesiologist, and I'll tell you the story in a minute, I'll show you some more slides, but he did not have delirium, and he went home with, with home care, all right? The third surgery, he came back through for the other side of the back with the same surgeon a few months later, and he experienced, he had failed also again on the screener, but the team at the nurse said, well, you know, you already did this before and you didn't have delirium. They've, they've learned, the hospital has learned what's best for you. So you can bypass going to see Kristen Hamlet and we'll just go ahead and we'll just push the whole thing through, all right? But he experienced delirium again and he was in the hospital for five days and then he had to go to inpatient rehab. All right, so that suggests that a more multidisciplinary care approach where you have somebody who's actively at the front lines may actually help the individuals, meaning the person who's the advocate. So here's what happened, what Kristen Hamblett did on the second time. So what she did is uh, she did a clinical interview with, the, with Mr. H. She found out that he'd having a three to four year history of memory changes per his wife, okay. Because um, right, the wives know. Yeah, I'm just joking, okay. <laughs> All right, and then and his wife had also taken over driving, um, but he was pretty independent in managing all of his other instrumental activities of daily living. 
He was taking Tylenol PM. Um, he'd been taking it uh, um, occasionally, but twice a month for sleep. Now, Tylenol PM is an anticholinergic medication. It actually interferes with the production of, of acetylcholine in the brain. Um, and some people will take it every night to help them sleep, or Benadryl, right? But we know, this is called a Magellan anticholinergic risk scale. We know that Tylenol PM is a very big predictor of, of delirium risk, okay? Um, and it's uh, high on an anticholinergic risk scale. Now, it hadn't been documented in his medical charts. Kristen figured this out when she did an interview with him because it was an over-the-counter med that he only occasionally uses. He had severe back pain. Back pain is a huge predictor for delirium. Um, the chronic, back pain, chronic pain in general is a big predictor for delirium because of the opioid use, et cetera. He was hard of hearing. Hard of hearing and any type of sensory deprivation is also a big predictor for, for developing delirium. All right, anytime you have sensory changes, but particularly for understanding and integrating with your environment and being aware of your environment, that, that presents a risk for that end of, for you, for developing um, confusion, okay? It's also a risk factor for memory difficulties. He was hard of hearing, but he wasn't wearing his hearing aids, all right? He hadn't been using any alcohol or tobacco, so that's good, all right? He had a family history of Alzheimer's disease, however. Reviewing the medical records, she found out that he had sleep apnea, hypertension, high, um, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, and asthma. Those are all risk factors for small vessel vascular changes in the brain. He was also very frail, and he had had a prior history of delirium, which is also another risk factor for delirium, for having it again, if you've had it before. And again, we mentioned the high-risk anticholinergics that he was taking, not only Tylenol PM, but also another, a, a series of other medications. So she estimated, she sat down with him and did some memory and thinking testing with him. What she identified is that he was having moderate impairment in memory. He was also having some issues with some word finding elements. And she identified that he met criteria for at least early signs of Alzheimer's disease, all right? An anestic mild cognitive impairment or a prodromal type of early form potentially of Alzheimer's disease. So she classified him as high risk and she um, sent a note and contacted the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the primary care physician, and she asked for a multidisciplinary team planning for this individual. So what happened next was pretty fantastic. One of our favorite anesthesiologists, what he did is he actually took that note, and what he decided to do when he identified her risk, or his risk, is he titrated the anesthetic. He used propofol infusion and he titrated it using an EEG monitor on the, on, the, on the brain, on the skull, all right, which is called a bispectral index monitor. He titrated and, and optimized the opioid use that was going to be given postoperatively to manage the pain. And he referred to geriatric medicine, which is fantastic. We love geriatric physicians, all right? So here's a comparison of the anesthetic management choices that were different because the anesthesiologist was more knowledgeable about the brain risk for his patient. So these are just some differences in the type of anesthetic that he used, how long the surgery was. Now you can see the second surgery was shorter, so that obviously does play a role um, because we know that longer surgeries can have a greater risk for developing delirium, okay? But there are all these other changes that happened uh, with regard to also his care postoperatively. And then probably one of the most uh, unique things about the program is like we also have geriatricians who um, will, will come in to make preventative changes before delirium happens. So Miriam Mufti was a geriatrician who came in and she made a whole host of changes to the um, prescriptions, pharmaceutical changes that, that, that he was having in the hospital, but then she also made behavioral recommendations for him. So, so that was the, that's the care plan of the perioperative care plan. Okay, so, um, sorry, yep, I'm just going, I'm just running right through these slides accidentally, so I'm sorry. But what we're trying to do, what's our vision here? So um, as a care provider, what we try to do is we try to discuss particularly with the anesthesiologist, things like, okay, if an individual has Parkinson's disease, how can we optimize them for if they are gonna have a surgical procedure? Are there certain times of the day when your medications work best? When, if you're taking carbidopa, levodopa, is there a certain time where you're on, 
on, uh, where you feel on, right, versus off. Where does it wane? The surgeons and the anesthesiologists don't typically think about that when they schedule your surgery. So that's one thing that we talk to them about, is when's the best time to have your surgery procedure? We talk to them about medication issues. We talk to them about anxiety and depression. Did you know that when you're anxious, your, left, your right frontal lobe is very busy? And when you're depressed and you're not treated, your left frontal lobe is very, it might be a little slower. So there's actually a difference in how an individual who's really anxious responds to anesthetic versus an individual who is depressed and how they respond to anesthesia. So the, we helped inform the anesthesiologist about that. We also uh, make recommendations about using an EEG, an electrical act activation monitor that goes on the front forcep, um, frontal area of the brain of the skull to help monitor brain activation. Um, and then we place consult requests and we request follow-ups. We put this all within the anesthesiologist notes um, so they can see it the day of your surgery. Okay, so what we're trying to do is improve precision medicine tailored for each individual. And we're really trying to establish the groundwork for this type of, these type of programs to be across the state of Florida. Um, and we're also putting in a really fantastic grant to, what's, um, to a fantastic funding agency. It's called a Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. What they do actually is this, uh, they actually helped uh, fund the, a lot of the, the information that was provided to you by the Parkinson's Foundation. They helped to fund the booklets for this, this organization, the PCORI Grant, the PCORI Institute. But you should be aware of this institute because what they do is they try to push research forward that you want. So we've heard, as, as the providers at UF, we've heard that patients really want to have brain wellness optimized uh, for them prior to surgery. At least a certain percentage of people do. So what we're trying to do is assess what is the actual added value of having brain checks before surgery? So we're putting together an actual study that's called Assessing the Value of Preoperative Brain Wellness Exams for Older Adults with Surgery, Electing Surgery with Anesthesia. And we're trying to harness uh, Jacksonville, Gainesville, and Central Florida to do a comparison, to do an um, effectiveness study on this. And we're always looking for stakeholders and individuals in the community who also want to champion and have this. So just so you're aware, this is a, a project that we're doing for you. All right. Now, and if you want more, more information on that, please, i am be happy to talk to you about that later. So now what can you do on your own? Well, you need to continue to be an advocate for yourself. Only you know yourself the best. If you are electing a surgery for a quality of life, um, uh, reason, such as a shoulder surgery, hip, knee surgery, back surgery, anything that has to do with just quality of life, go for it, right? You don't want to hold yourself back, but just be armed and be knowledgeable about it. Make sure you use the information provided by the Parkinson's Foundation. They also um, have a kit for you that you can get for free. Um, if you have brain questions about you know, how you can optimize things, feel free to reach out to us. You do not have to be having your surgery at UF. We're here for you. Um, there are other things you can do. There's, this is a great book. I love this book. I'm not, I did not write this book, but <laughs> I'm just championing it because I found it to be a very useful book. It's called Keeping Your Brain Alive, and, and it has neurobic exercises. You can find it on Amazon. It was written by Dr. Katz and Dr. Rubin. It's got lots of different exercises for you that you can do very easy within your home. All right, so just arm yourself, exercise as well, meditation, um, anxiety reduction. So that's it for me. I'm just here to champion brain wellness for you. Uh, make sure that, that you stay healthy around the time of electing surgery with procedures. And thank you so much for having me here. Once you have suffered brain injury from surgery, are there any rehabilitative oh. programs available? Yes, so there is. there are rehab programs for cognitive rehab. Depends on the type of injury that a person may experience. Do you have any particular injury in mind that you're considering, that you're thinking of? Is it? Okay, here we go. In my case, two years ago I had a, I had a hip replacement. And I'm, of course, well up in years. 
No one ever told me about anything about anesthesia problems. Yeah. Nothing. But when I came out of that, I had a huge memory loss and still do. And I'd like to know if there's anything that can be done about that or am I just, that's the way it's going to be. Okay. So you had a hip surgery a few years ago, and after your hip surgery, you experienced a significant change that you identified in memory function. Terrible, okay. And you are wondering, so and it's continued to remain for you, you're saying, okay. So first off, thank you so much for sharing that information, because that's really um, useful for other people to hear. Uh, I'm sorry you had that experience. Uh, so there are, so one thing to do, there are a number of things to do. Obviously, there's the optimization of making sure that you're taking care of yourself physically, which it looks like you are, and you're engaged, and you're doing things in the community, so that's fantastic. Another thing is you could reach out and get a cognitive check just to see really, okay, so where are you right now? That's a good thing, and also talking to your neurologist. So to get some objective information about how you're doing. And then when you sit with somebody to figure out objectively what's going on, then that person can tailor some ideas for you, okay? They can actually give you recommendations because there might be some things going on for you that you haven't recognized, right? So perhaps there's some medication issues. Maybe there's um, some timing aspects. Maybe there's stress and anxiety. All those things play a role into memory function, okay? So there are some things that can be optimized there. From a cognitive rehab standpoint, there are things like there are self-help books that you can do. Um, uh, there may be some medications that can help. So it really just comes down to understanding you as a person. But from a organized standpoint, there is no post-operative cognitive intervention program available for people who have experienced memory issues. Right. I'm going to go ahead and repeat the questions for the virtual audience and everything, just in case. So the question was, from personal experience, there seems to be resistance. And first of all, is this a regional-only program, or is it more national? And maybe just sharing that you've had an experience that you've actually asked for less anesthesia, and you really don't get a guarantee that that's how it's going to go. And just any comments about sure. that? Sure. No, I, I appreciate the fact that it's very frustrating when you're trying to work with your medical team, uh, because it seems like when you're going into a surgery, it's basic, it's, it's a lack of control, right? You're putting your life into their hands, right? Um, uh, anesthesiologists really try to tailor and c consider that aspects. The surgeons are focused on making sure that your joint gets in appropriately. They want to do the best for that region of area. And the anesthesiologist is the person you want to talk to. So um, you did the right thing by talking to your anesthesiologist and voicing your opinions of what you would prefer. And then their job is to tailor it the best that they think. Um, now, one thing, it, it is still frustrating. One, one thing I can appreciate for you, for you, but the one thing that we try to do is at least be an advocate or an intermediary to voice that concern to your anesthesiologist on, a, on another level, maybe um, as a more collaborative level with them as, as the neuropsychologist or the behavioral neurologist. Um, so it, it can sometimes differ. And that's why we actually need to do an effectiveness study that I was telling you about by PCORI. Um, is this uh, national? No. It's local to UF. It was, gra it was grassroots from UF because of this. But with that said, it can be accessed by anybody in the state of Florida. So if somebody is having surgery, they can, we can consult with them through telemedicine. And we can talk to their anesthesiology and surgery team still. So it doesn't, they don't have to be having surgery at UF. Yeah. I'm sorry you had that experience. Yeah, and a nice thing to be aware is the Parkinson Foundation is actually doing some active projects to improve the safety of global hospitalization, yes. not specific to anesthesia. But UF is part of this yeah. safe hospitalization initiative. And we're working with the computer people. Yep. We're working with the pharmacists, the nurses. We're going to train all the inpatient nurses, at least at our hospital. That's only one hospital. Many of you may go to other hospitals. But little by little, we're trying to move the needle and getting the word out yep. that people with Parkinson's may need to be, may, certain medicines need to be avoided. Certain yes. medicines are safer. Medicines on time are important. And so this is all being worked yes. on. Yep. It takes a long time, but UF really is, is champing it, and Fixel is. 
Here's a good question, Dr. Price. From the virtual audience, should a Parkinson's, an individual with Parkinson's disease be concerned about the anesthesia used for colonoscopy ah, or that's EGD? That's a great question. I love that question. Whoever asked that question, yes. Okay. The, uh, we don't know. So we're actually doing a study right now where we're looking at how the brain changes um, pre colonoscopy prep to post colonoscopy prep to post colonoscopy with that anesthetic, right, with the propofol that they give. So we do not know how individuals with Parkinson's disease, how their brain changes differently from individuals who do not have Parkinson's disease. Um, we do know from pilot data that the brain, you know, it becomes, a, it, it's sensitive to just the act of the dehydration from the colon prep. Um, people, the, the brain networks uh, change a little bit, and then they change a little bit also after the colonoscopy, but um, most people go and they do fine with the colonoscopy. We just don't know how the brain changes and we don't know how to change or tailor recommendations for individuals who have Parkinson's disease. That's a great question. So really we don't know, but it may be, it's probably safer than general anesthesia. It's, but we don't know if it's yes. 100, we don't really Yes, know. and propofol is very safe, honestly, from what we know from the research with humans. Um, so, you know, just communicating your concerns to your anesthesiologist is the best thing. Just make sure you stay, you're very open to communicating with your team members. Yeah. This is another, oh great, I'm so happy to see hands up. I'm going to um, ask this question and then I'll come to the audience. This question is good. She says, I'm thinking being able to have a pre-surgery consultation is an appointment making event and my husband is a huge fall risk. What if he falls suddenly and needs unexpected surgery? Is there a way that he could have the cognitive check placed in his medical record just in case? So she's saying, sure, if we plan the surgery, we could do all of this. Is there something, some kind of checkup we should do just in case we need unexpected oh, surgery? That's a great, so you're saying, you're asking for a brain check to be put in your medical chart. And so yes, you can put the brain check in your chart and, and uh, the nurse, the team will have that to look at in the media records. I, I strongly encourage everybody to get a brain check. Yes. Last question, you mentioned a study. Is it something people can get into now? Oh. The colonoscopy study? Yes. We would love to have individuals who are having, if you're choosing a colonoscopy, oh joy, right? But if, and if you want to do research, we would love to be able to work with you so that we can assess, to, to, as a, we'd love that. And the, the follow-up she said was how? How do I get ah, involved or how just, does my loved one? Just tell me. We will, we will get, you will get three free brain MRIs. You'll get the information and um, we will help coordinate and schedule you with your, with your, we'll help you schedule the colonoscopy and work with your team. And then we'll follow you um, around the time of your colonoscopy. Yep. And I, would you say that if someone isn't here, maybe you, they need to consult with a family member, they could always just talk to their doc and their doc will get them to you. If people don't know how to find Dr. Price, yes, definitely just reach at out to your uh, care provider at our clinic and we'll make sure to get you in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maloney. I'm the one who's going to have to at least do some kind of a cognitive test now yep. that, you know, this was brought up. Um, what else do I have besides the mini mental status exam? Well, or, or, or you have? a couple of things. So there's a, I can show you some very easy things to do um, over at the table later if you want. But then also, I'm, for, it's fantastic that you're advocating for your patients that is, and you're doing something at a baseline. That is fantastic. Um, that, that's a Taj Mahal. The fact that you're doing that is beautiful. Um, if you are at UF, you can just refer to us and we can see a person before their surgery. Um, that's not a problem. So I know typical neuropsychology has a very long wait time, but we're open five days a week. We, we work from n all hours of the day and we see patients and it's an hour and a half evaluation. So, and we will then route the note to you and we'll put that note in their medical chart. And then if the person experiences cognitive issues after her surgical procedure, we at least have a baseline for a comparison point. So, um, so we can definitely do that. Um, so there's two options, 
you could refer if you wanted, or if not, and you want to have your own, which is fantastic. The mini mental is great. We like clock drawing to command and copy condition. Um, and I like months forwards and backwards. That's great. And then digits, but that's all within the MMSE. But if you can do the MMSE, that's, that's fantastic. So first off, I hope that's not the main message that I'm advocating. Uh, I think surgery is great. I think anesthesiologists are great. Colonoscopies are very important for preventing many neg very um, some very evil things out there. We colonoscopies are good. Okay. What I'm trying to advocate is that just be a knowledgeable consumer. That's it. All right, and, um, and to consider brain function and ask your team members to consider brain function too. That's it. Um, so there are natural things that you can do, but sometimes, you know, there's, if you have bone on bone for your knee and you're having a reduced quality of life and you're not able to walk or a hip that is not moving, there are fantastic surgical procedures that can change, right? Shoulder surgery. So. Don't, don't deny yourself a quality of life improvement strategy that's available, particularly with all of the technological advances that are going out there. The only thing I advocate for you to do is to consider brain wellness and to talk to your physicians about the need for that and to know that there are resources available for you, okay, and that the Fixel Center and where we're trying to really improve that for you. Yep. And I would just add to that, um, I think this is an important point that you said, boy, if I'm hearing this, it's almost like just don't get surgery. And sure, I think we all would agree we don't want surgery if we need it, but there are times where that's really necessary. So there are times it's very obvious. If you're having a heart attack, you have to have a procedure that's appropriate to that. If you have a bleeding in your brain, you have to have a surgery to, to potentially to help with that. So there's some surgeries where it's so obvious you have to do them because you need them. And if you're so immobilized that you can't exercise, this is also terrible for your brain. So there are times where a surgery is better for your brain. Then there are other times where clearly you could live without that surgery. Specifically, I remember a patient with Parkinson's who was considering an, a cosmetic surgery that she had always thought she would do one day um, that was just to enhance her physical appearance. It wasn't for something needed, but she had always wanted that. And that's when we would have an important talk. Well, let's see how, it ris how risky it is. So I think Dr. Price's project is so important because then you can choose. What, if I'm not at high risk, then I might do that thing I'm on the borderline of whether I should do or not. If I'm very high risk, then I may really try everything to not have a particular surgery that's not necessary. And also just being able to, right now we heard, well, my anesthesia team didn't make me any promises even though I asked them to be careful. Right. But the more we learn about this and it becomes very much you know, uh, uniform knowledge to people, yeah. there may develop new protocols that are safer. And so this is kind of a work in progress. That's exactly right. And the question I want to comment on the ColoGuard, that's a screening uh, where people check a stool sample instead of a full colonoscopy. And they're depending on risk level. Sometimes that's appropriate. And sometimes your doctor would tell you, no, you actually need, we have to visualize what's going on in there. The symptoms or risk you have are different. So always make these decisions together yep. with your doctor. Thank you. That was lovely. Yeah. Well said. So All right. Thank you, everyone.